Good morning, and welcome to the Professional Responsibility and Legal Education Panel on Technology, Social Media, and Professional Ethics. Uh, my name is Barry Anderson. I'm an Associate Justice on the Minnesota Supreme Court. I'm filling in for Jack Park, who normally handles the introduction of our moderator. I'm going to do that here in just a minute. I first want to thank all of you for attending here today, those of you who will be watching the video, and I want to thank our panel for participating. I do have one note that I want to share with you. Those of you who were with us last year and many previous years know that an important member of our committee was Professor Ronald Rotunda. Professor Rotunda passed away this past year. Tremendous loss to all of us. Um, I do want to mention in conjunction with Professor Rotunda's service that we're likely to do a teleforum about his uh, career and life. Um, I also want to mention to those of you who can get to the John Marshall presentation this afternoon, you should do so. Uh, I, I certainly recommend uh, Richard Brookheiser's book on Marshall, but I also want to pass along to you that Professor Rotunda has a book. It's a little more academic, a little more case-oriented uh, about John Marshall, entitled John Marshall and the Cases that United the States of America. Uh, that book was uh, published just shortly before he died, and uh, I also recommend it to you. My principal duties today are to introduce your moderator and then get out of the way. So I will proceed to that task now. Our moderator today will be Judge Don Willett of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals. I know him uh, previously as a member of the Texas Supreme Court, where he served for uh, over a decade, uh, 12 years in fact. Uh, Judge Willett has a distinguished resume. Uh, he served as legal counsel for a Texas Attorney General, a Texas Governor, a U.S. Attorney General, and the President of the United States. His biography notes that he was raised by a widow mom in a double-wide tra trailer in a town of 32 people. This, incidentally, uh, puts him ahead of the Chief Justice of the Minnesota Supreme Court, who always points out that she grew up in a town of 292 people, so that's about, what, uh, t less than 10%, something like that. Um, but he, is, uh, he has a distinguished career as uh, uh, an author and speaks frequently throughout the country. I do want to note his uh, academic uh, career. Um, he, uh, he earned a triple major from Baylor University and then went to Duke University and liked it so much he wouldn't leave. He uh, earned three degrees there, uh, a Juris Doctor, an MA in Political Science, and an LLM in Judicial Studies. Um, he has uh, clerked for Judge Jerry Williams on the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit and practiced law um, before uh, entering public service. Distinguished career in public service, and I am delighted to introduce to you Judge Don Willett. Thank you. Your Honor, thanks for, the, thanks for the gracious introduction. Thank you, everybody. I'm thrilled to moderate this impeccably dressed panel on <laughs> technology, social media, and professional ethics. Um, I read an article last week that opened this way. If you want to become a miserable partisan who spends more time being angry at people you've never met than enjoying the company of friends, neighbors, and loved ones, then Twitter is the place for you. <laughs> Today's all-star panel will discuss the legal community as an online community. We inhabit a wired world. Twitter processes a billion tweets every 48 hours, half of those from this panel. <laughs> there are more than two billion people on Facebook, there are 800 million users on Instagram and Snapchat. So for lawyers in 2018, technology is impossible to ignore, it's ubiquitous. And more and more Americans get their news from and view the world through um, social media. But lawyering and judging in the digital age is rife with ethical minefields. So what are the rules of engagement for the legal community when it comes to social media? And our panelists today will discuss the promise and the perils of technology and social media for lawyers and courts and judges. Each speaker will, if all goes according to plan, speak for about eight minutes, roughly, 
and then we'll have some spirited, lively, cross-panel debate, and then we'll wrap up with some speeches from the audience. So, <laughs> sorry, we'll wrap up with some very tweet-length questions from the audience at one of our two microphones. Um, so batting leadoff to my immediate left is John Browning, AKA at the real John Brow. You can see all of our Twitter handles are at the bottom of our name cards. John is my sometimes co-presenter and co-author in his non, so by, by day, he's a litigation partner in Dallas, handling virtually, virtually every type of matter in virtually every type of court, but in his non-billable time, he moonlights as perhaps the nation's, I mean, strike that perhaps, the nation's leading published authority on social media and the law. He's written countless books and articles on the topic with more forthcoming, including some stuff with me, I, I hope. Um, he's probably the nation's most sought after speaker on lawyers' use of technology and social media. He's written more than 25 law review articles, many of them award-winning. He's probably the most quoted authority in America on this topic by major national press, both print and TV, and at legal symposium symposia all over the country. So bottom line, John is the singular authority on this stuff. But strangely, he doesn't tweet much himself. Um, at, the real John, at the real John Brow has tweeted only 31 times. The last time on the day I was nominated a year ago, a date which will live in infamy. Uh, <laughs> in fact, someone tweeted last week, John Browning needs to be on Twitter, he's hilarious. So John is a former varsity tennis player and a teaching pro, and my favorite all-time fact about John is that he won the gold medal in men's singles at the 2000 Clydesdale World Games in Mexico City. It's an international competition for athletes 200 pounds and over. Oh, wrong one, <laughs> wrong one. There we go! Look on the right, there's John and his doubles partner. And he did this one week after undergoing emergency appendectomy surgery. It's incredible. So John's gonna focus on how today's practice environment makes it essential for lawyers to maintain tech competency, including being fluent in social media. Next will be, as we go down the table, David Latt, AKA at David Latt, David is editor-at-large and founding editor of Above the Law, but he first gained notoriety as the mysterious ghost blogger at Underneath Their Robes, an irreverent, and I've got to say must-read, blog about federal judges. Um, David was leading a double life, so by day he was a hard-nosed AUSA, and he was a blog world sensation by night. So. He's also served time as a big law associate in Manhattan and a law clerk to the legendary Judge O'Scanlan on the Ninth Circuit. David grew up down the street from President Richard Nixon, who would give him candy, right? right. That's right. Graduate of Harvard College and Yale Law School, and a few years ago published his first novel, the much buzzed about Supreme Ambitions. Um, last year, David and his husband, Zach, welcomed into the world you saw it earlier. That's not David. <laughs> yeah, there we go. David. He welcomed into the world Judge Dillard. No, no, into the world. Harlan, this is Harlan, everyone. Yes, named after the justices, plural, or the great dissenter. He doesn't look like a great dissenter to me. That's a He's cute just rhino. Up. So welcomed into the world Harlan. So at the, the kid is a rhino. So at that time, <laughs> at that he's gonna, time, he's an elephant next year. <laughs> this is going to be a lively panel. Uh, so when Harlan came along, David stepped away um, as managing editor of Above the Law, moved into a more flexible role of editor at large, and he wants to make it clear that this means he no longer has responsibility for any above the law stories except the ones that he authors personally. And he dissents respectfully, but fervently from many of the stories that now appear 
on above the law. So after John's words of caution, David will outline the benefits of social media and speak about the evolution of online media generally. Next, Chief Judge Stephen Dillard, a.k.a. at Judge Dillard. Stephen has served on the Georgia Court of Appeals for eight years and the last year or so as Chief Judge. He's a proud member of the so-called Mannion Mafia, having clerked for Judge Stephen Mannion on the Sixth Circuit. And he was an appellate specialist in private practice for many years before assuming the bench. Chief Judge Dillard and I met, this will shock many of you, on Twitter. <laughs> and he has since become a dear, dear friend. Uh, he speaks and writes frequently and eloquently across the country on a range of topics, including the judicial use of social media. And it's true that more and more judges are becoming more adept, more prolific, um, using social media in their personal and professional lives to stay connected and to stay elected. Um, and as his 15,000 followers can tell you, Chief Judge Dillard is living proof that a judge can engage online with surpassing civility and good humor with a healthy dose of civic education to boot. And I think every day his online activity underscores rather than undermines public confidence in the judiciary and public understanding of the judiciary. So as he puts it, judges are public servants. They are accountable to the people and they need to be accessible to the people. Chief Judge Dillard is president of the Alumni Association at Samford University. He's wearing a Samford University bulldog bow tie, not a Georgia bulldog bow tie. Um, he was recently named Alumnus of the Year, and he can frequently be seen prowling the sidelines. Where is it? That's not David. <laughs> there he is. Prowling the sidelines at Samford Bulldog football games. So Chief Judge Diller is going to focus his remarks along the lines of a really exceptional article he published recently in Judicature, the scholarly journal for judges, about the benefits of judges engaging with citizens that they serve on the social media platforms that people use every day and educating folks about the important role the judiciary plays in their lives. And then finally, batting cleanup is Professor Josh M. Blackman of the South Texas College of Law, Houston, who borrowed one of my bow ties today. He doesn't own one. He made it for me. <laughs> He's got an official Fed sock bow tie. I met Josh about a decade ago when he was a law student, and today he is a highly caffeinated scholar who, <laughs> whose office looks like NASA Mission Control. Let me show you the picture. Look at that. That's his home office. He's got seven screens. Count them. Josh writes about everything. He speaks everywhere. And he tweets about, well, he tweets all the time about every topic under the sun. He ranks among the most prolific law professors on planet Earth. So Josh is barely 30 years old, but he hosts one of the top legal blogs in America. He's authored more than four dozen law review articles, a couple of critically acclaimed books. He publishes commentary in most every major national legal publication. He's a five-tool professor. He blogs, he tweets, he teaches, he writes, he speaks. And Josh is going to back clean up and be something of a gap filler today. So depending on how the conversation unfolds, he may cover, he's going to wing it, he may cover how courts can use social media more effectively, he may cover how profs and scholars can use it more effectively, or he may cover how the press covers the courts through social media. So with that introduction, I'll turn it over to John Browning. Take it away. All right. Well, I am wearing a bow tie for the very first time at uh, Judge Willett's behest. So uh, this is not a regular part of my um, wardrobe, but you I, can't I, I'm, see I'm, it. Thinking, I'm thinking it's actually going to be a regular part of it. Can y'all see it on the screen? Yeah. Star Wars bow tie. Uh, to, to go with the Star Wars cufflinks, because I fly my geek flag pretty proudly. Um, <laughs> So I guess I'm supposed to be the, the 
sayer of doom and gloom and, uh, and, and caution um, our audience about uh, that. But, you know, let me begin by acknowledging, uh, as Judge Willett pointed out, that we are practicing in a very different uh, environment now uh, for lawyers. Not just the fact that, uh, you know, the, the ubiquitousness of, of um, uh, social media with 293,000 status updates uh, posted every 60 seconds and 6,000 tweets every, every second, um, many of which may originate from somewhere else in D.C., uh, as well as this, uh, this panel. Um, but uh, we have got uh, a very different practice environment than um, many of us uh, who are a little more gray-haired like myself started practicing it. But the other reason besides the fact that social media is so all-pervasive uh, is that we are now being held to a higher standard as lawyers. In 2012, the ABA passed a uh, change to Model uh, Rule of Professional Conduct 1.1 on what constitutes competent representation. And now, uh, 33 states have adopted that uh, change. Uh, Texas is about to become state number 34. Uh, and it imposes a requirement on lawyers to not just keep up with the latest developments in one's area of practice, but also uh, to be conversant in the benefits and risks of relevant technology. Now, what does that mean? Well, you know, it, it depends on your practice, but it certainly means if you're handling litigation involving e-discovery, you should be either conversant in the use of e-discovery software, hire an outside vendor uh, who, who is going to do that in a competent manner, have someone on your staff to do it, or not take the engagement. Uh, the big Wells Fargo data breach uh, occurred in part because of a lawyer handling a fairly routine defamation case who didn't understand how to use the e-discovery software. Uh, you know, th this is just one example of, of many I could give you of uh, a lack of tech competence that has led uh, to this. So it's not just the fact that social media is inescapable, but it's also uh, the fact that we are practicing in very different times where we are under expectations of maintaining appropriate cybersecurity measures. Uh, the ABA just released a formal ethics opinion um, on that effect, and numerous jurisdictions have addressed this as well. Uh, we are under higher expectations in terms of uh, protecting our clients' confidences uh, through the use of technology, such as using encryption with email, and also uh, using social media in a responsible and ethical manner. So um, let me see if we <laughs> can actually advance uh -oh. the slides. There we go. Oh, okay. <clears throat> I'm wondering if I'm just not pointing it at the right thing here. Maybe up at the ceiling. Oh, ah, here okay. we go. All right, so you don't need to be a member of the geek squad, but you also can be the proverbial caveman lawyer from the old Saturday Night Live sketch. Um, you know, confounded by the strange box of noise and light that, you know, most of us refer to as the, as the computer. All right, All right here we go. Uh, so uh, just to give you a little bit of a taste of kind of a, a rogues gallery of incidents of maybe, you know, not living up to professional um, uh, standards, you probably, after winning a courtroom victory like this criminal defense lawyer um, in Wisconsin, you probably don't want to take that victory selfie in the courtroom <laughs> before the judge even leaves and then post it on Facebook, because guess what? The guy in the black robes with the gavel will not be clicking like, okay? <laughs> He will, however, issue a show cause order for you to come back and explain yourself. Uh, probably the best way to um, react to a major seizure of drugs and weapons if you're a, a young assistant prosecutor is not to pose uh, for a selfie with uh, one of the sheriff's deputies involved in the seizure with some of the weapons that were seized <laughs> and caption it, you should take the plea. <clears throat> your, 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 bosses, your bosses may not find that consistent with proper evidence room protocol. Go figure. 
Um, and, and this is actually um, a, a lawyer from Chicago who was in a federal uh, courtroom, and he, was, he actually is a securities litigator. He wasn't there on one of his own cases, but he was blogging about a big securities uh, fraud trial. And he happened to be tweeting from the courtroom, including tweeting, I think there were about nine tweets total, um, of some of the evidence, some of the exhibits that hadn't even been admitted yet. Uh, there was a uh, very helpful FBI agent in the courtroom who very helpfully pointed out the big sign uh, of Federal Rule of Criminal Procedure 53 saying no broadcasting, photography, or recording allowed. And he very helpfully escorted uh, that lawyer uh, to the judge for a show cause hearing and uh, a $5,000 fine, 40 hours of community service, and one mandatory uh, CLE seminar on social media and legal ethics. Is he here, by the way? Um, I don't, I'm, not, I, I'm not sure if he's ever satisfied it, but um, that's what was uh, the sentence from uh, the court who, you know, was not very amused uh, at that. Let's see. Okay, now, uh, we all know it's important uh, that we adequately communicate with our clients, right? And uh, this gentleman, uh, Curtis Jackson Jr., AKA 50 Cent, or as you know, some of you folks may know him, Fiddy. Um, <laughs> Fiddy had, uh, well, you know, that's how I roll. Um, so, so 50 Cent had a multi-million dollar judgment entered against him, and he did what many people do when multi-million dollar judgments are entered against him. They file for bankruptcy protection. But somewhere along the line, the fundamental underlying principle under, behind bankruptcy law was not fully communicated between 50 Cent's lawyers and him. Uh, the idea that you cannot pay your creditors because you do not have the money to pay your creditors. <laughs> And so uh, 50 Cent was posting on Instagram very prolifically uh, photos like this, and I believe the correct hip hop vernacular, and correct me if I'm, I'm wrong, Judge Willa, but I believe it's fat stacks of cash, yo, um, <laughs> was, was posting all of these, which led to uh, the folks on the other side, the creditor's lawyers, questioning whether or not his bankruptcy petition was valid or not. <clears throat> And that led to another show cause hearing, um, although one of the photos I could not save, because uh, it was deleted too quickly, was 50 Cent in the federal courthouse itself holding up fat stacks of cash, yo. <laughs> and, and that did not amuse the federal judge very much either. I think he, I think he learned a lesson about that. Um, this is, um, uh, again, sometimes lawyers forget the fact that um, you know these social media platforms uh, are very public. And uh, I published an article earlier this year called Taking the Heat for a Tweet, which pointed out while, while you may have a First Amendment right to air your, your views, uh, there are going to be consequences. Uh, this lawyer from the Austin, Texas area uh, was not happy with a uh, cabinet member's decision uh, to um, uh, revise certain Obama administration era um, uh, guidelines on handling campus sexual assault investigations. And so he tweeted that he would be okay if uh, that uh, particular individual were sexually assaulted. Um, wishing sexual violence on anyone is really not a good career move, to say the least. Um, he wound up parting ways with his law firm almost immediately thereafter. So, you know, very difficult um, sort of thing when you, you venture, as uh, this individual who is a senior in-house counsel with CBS, she posted on Facebook um, shortly after the tragic Las Vegas uh, mass shootings uh, that uh, she actually had uh, no sympathy for the victims because uh, it was a country music uh, concert and uh, country music fans were just a bunch of, as she put it, Republican gun toters. CBS fired her. Uh, immediately and issued a statement indicating that her uh, comments on Facebook were not consistent with their values. I think, let me see if we have any others. Oh yeah, um, and then there was a prosecutor from um, uh, Orlando, uh, and this was, this was actually not his first questionable uh, Facebook post. Uh, he actually posted this uh, before he posted about the Orlando nightclub shootings, 
and uh, that was the one that actually got him fired. Um, and uh, again, you know, he was doing this and made no distinction between his work as an individual or his views as an individual and his status as a uh, prosecutor. And, and every time I talk to audiences of lawyers, I hear lawyers say, well, John, I'm a boring transactional lawyer. I'm a boring tax lawyer. That's actually redundant. Um, <laughs> I'm, a, I'm a boring appellate lawyer. Uh, so I, I don't need to worry about this stuff. That's the, the litigators who get in that kind of trouble. No, it's not. Uh, boring appellate lawyers do too. Uh, this was a staff attorney uh, for the Kansas Court of Appeals, and uh, she took great delight in the fact that a former attorney general from that state was uh, actually in the midst of a disciplinary hearing before the Kansas Supreme Court. She didn't agree with him politically, and so she live tweeted his disciplinary proceeding, and a number of the things that she tweeted, uh, not very appropriate, um, and uh, she wound up being, you know, those came to light, and she was fired from her job, and perhaps in the most ironic twist, and it's actually kind of funny that her, her Twitter profile picture was her going shh, because she should have taken her own advice. Um, she actually uh, wound up on the receiving end of a disciplinary proceeding herself. So what goes around comes around. And I think that, oh, and of course, um, we have to have some mention of the fact that there are a lot of, a growing number of judges who are active on social media, uh, <clears throat> including the, the gentleman to my right. Uh, now, there are do's and don'ts uh, if you are a judge on social media. Uh, don't be like the Ohio, former Ohio Supreme Court Justice who responded to the Me Too movement uh, while he was running for uh, governor of Ohio by going on Facebook and boasting about your sexual conquest in great detail. <laughs> Not a good idea. And by the way, he placed a distant fourth in his Democratic primary. But do be like one of the gold standards, like uh, uh, Judge Dillard uh, or Judge Willett, um, and you know, post things that you know, obviously don't involve commentary on cases or parties. Uh, but in this case, you know, a, a humorous tweet, don't consult a dove wrapper for oral argument advice. Ignore the clock. So um, you know, with that, I think uh, that, that kind of gives you an overview of some of the the danger areas, and we'll talk more uh, about that as the, as the panel progresses. John, thanks so much. David, take it away. Uh, thank you. Can everyone hear me, including at the back? Okay, great. Uh, John is a, a tough act to follow. Uh, Judge Willett, uh, thank you so much for putting together this panel. Uh, I have to confess, because of your years of great tweeting as the uh, Twitter, tweet, Twitter laureate of Texas and as a member of the Texas Supreme Court, uh, you'll always be in some ways Justice Willett to me, and perhaps you'll be Justice Willett again. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> uh, I must also thank Judge Willett for forcing me, a 40-something-year-old man, to Learn how to tie a bow tie. Uh, I have spent several hours on YouTube this week and uh, about a half hour on YouTube this morning, and I still needed a tune up from Judge, uh, Chief Judge Dillard, uh, but I think I now have a reasonable facsimile of a bow tie. <clears throat> so it's uh, great to see such a large crowd here for our Saturday morning panel. Uh, I know my uh, co panelists are a great draw, uh, but I also know that we had you at ethics credit. Yeah. Um, and I have to say it is an honor to be on this stage at the Federalist Society National Lawyers Convention. As a right of center legal nerd, this has definitely uh, been a uh, bucket list item, and so it is really a thrill to be here. Uh, as Judge Willett mentioned, uh, before I started Above the Law, I had a blog called Underneath Their Robes, which was irreverent, occasionally snarky about members of the federal judiciary while I was working as a federal prosecutor, and you can read about the whole saga online, but in many ways, I'm like the f you know, former felon who who now goes to schools and says, here's what you should not do. Uh, so uh, there's that. But uh, I mean, my story all worked out in the end. I found uh, new gainful employment in a different industry, but uh, others may not be so fortunate. Uh, and I have to say, uh, 
uh, I've been writing about this conference dating back to Underneath Their Robes. I uh, wrote a post about the 2005 convention, which you can still find online, uh, called uh, Robing Room Report, Federalist Fiesta Edition, where I gave out awards for things like the funniest panelist, that was uh, John Yu, uh, prom queen and king, and of course, I had to recognize the wife of my former boss, uh, she's right here, uh, Mrs. Maura Nolan O'Scanlan as best dressed judicial spouse. Uh, so you should. Uh... <laughs> So uh, as a blogger, I've actually been involved in the social media world, uh, really dating back to 2004. And actually, Chief Judge Dillard, too, uh, was a uh, former uh, blogger. Uh, blogging is really one of the earliest forms of social media. And services like Facebook and Twitter were initially called microblogs. Now, given the lengthy screeds that people post on both services, the micro is probably no longer applicable. Uh, but you can still uh, get the sense of the DNA of Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and other services uh, in the traditional blogs, which are still, of course, very much uh, alive and well. So why am I here on this panel? Uh, after John uh, put the uh, fear of God in you by offering you a lot of cautionary tales, uh, and of course, you can read about my own online, as I mentioned, I'm here to really tell you that technology and social media are your friends. Uh, or at the very least, they can be used in ways that advance your career uh, rather than destroy it. So I'm going to make three quick points. Uh, and I wanna, we want to leave a lot of time for questions because social media, of course, is all about social interaction, and so it wouldn't be very fitting for us to sit here and lecture you for 90 minutes. So, uh, point number one, social media is really nothing to be afraid of. Uh, lawyers can sometimes be Luddites or technophobes. Uh, a lot of us went to law school because we were not STEM people, but we're still interested in gainful employment. Uh, I'm a former English major myself. Uh, and so for many lawyers, social media and technology in general can be exotic and even scary. And cautionary tales like the ones that John shared might reinforce this view. Uh, but at the end of the day, social media and technology are just like any other tools available to lawyers. They can be used wisely or unwisely. Uh, they can be used ethically or unethically. They are really just what you make of them. Uh, so this is why the American Bar Association's uh, duty of technology competence, which John mentioned, uh, adopted by 33 states, I had 32 in my notes, but John just updated me, is actually, as a technical matter, a comment to the existing rule of technology competence uh, rather than a new rule itself. What the ABA is basically saying is your existing duty of rendering competent res representation to your clients includes a duty to keep abreast of relevant uh, developments in the law and its practice, including the benefits and risks associated with uh, new technology. So in many ways, you can think of this as, to make this more interesting to the FedSoc crowd, uh, something analogous <coughs> to constitutional law. Uh, we're here at the Federalist Society. We do not believe in a living, breathing, stair-mastering constitution. So the rules stay the same, but their application to different forms of technology will, of course, constantly arise. So for example, we have the Fourth Amendment, and the rules and principles of that amendment are fixed. But how it applies to GPS, how it applies to cell phone searches, that, of course, will evolve and change as the technology also evolves and changes. So in the final analysis, the responsible use of social media is really just about exercising good judgment. I think the examples that John pointed out in many ways are about it could have been avoided by just a modicum of common sense uh, or not exercising bad judgment. And so if you're a lawyer and you are exercising judgment and providing advice to your clients uh, for a living, uh, if you're exercising in this judgment in this form, uh, you shouldn't be afraid of exercising it uh, on social media as well. So point number two, social media. Everybody's doing it. Now, of course, when you said this to your mom as a kid in order to get permission to do something, and she said, well, if everyone jumped off a bridge, would you? Well, if you're a lawyer or a law firm, yes. Uh, <laughs> this, this is a profession very much uh, focused on, obsessed with precedent. It's a profession where peer pressure exerts a very strong pull. Uh, this is why when one major law firm raises salaries, uh, pretty much everyone else falls in line as we breathlessly report on above the law. And so I think it will be perhaps persuasive to those of you who are more resistant uh, to social media to learn about how many of your peers are actually actively involved and engaged with it. So a survey by the ABA last year found that 81% of lawyers use social media for professional purposes. 77% uh, of these lawyers reported that their law firms had some kind of social media presence. Uh, what do lawyers use social media for? The, uh, the top uh, purposes are uh, career development and networking, so pretty much more than 90% of lawyers have LinkedIn profiles. Uh, second, client development. Uh, third, education and general awareness. And fourth, uh, case investigation. 
And social media does bring benefits to lawyers. Uh, of the lawyers using social media, 27% uh, reported that they had actually obtained clients uh, from their use of social media. Now, of course, this will vary depending on your practice. If you uh, have a very consumer-focused practice, you will get more work out of social media. If you are at an Amlaw 100 firm representing large companies, you probably aren't going to be landing that billion-dollar securities class action defense from Facebook. But uh, on the other hand, uh, I will note that I've seen, uh, perhaps just because of my connections to the vast right-wing conspiracy, I've seen a fair number of uh, general counsel of publicly traded large companies on Facebook. They might be posting about their pets or their kids, but if you interact with them on Facebook, uh, in a way, you're keeping yourself top of mind. And even though ways of retaining outside counsel are getting more uh, professionalized and also more bureaucratic, sometimes whether you get an engagement is just whether the GC or a deputy or associate GC happens to remember you. And if you are engaging with them on social media, even on a platform uh, not explicitly professional like Facebook, that can often uh, be an advantage. So uh, here's my third and final point. Uh, which is if you're not using social media or if you're at least not cognizant of it or don't understand its nuances, you could actually be violating your ethical duties. Uh, as noted uh, by John, there is this uh, widely adopted comment to the ABA uh, model rule that, of competence that makes this clear. And you can find a whole host of specific examples where lawyers' aversion to technology or to social media actually got them into trouble. So for example, in a 2010 case, uh, Johnson v. McCulloch, uh, the Missouri Supreme Court held that it was actually a, uh, uh, that uh, lawyers actually have an affirmative duty to research prospective jurors online. Now, uh, this is actually one of the emerging issues in social media for lawyers, uh, the extent to which you can turn to social media in the voir dire process. So you should check the rules of your own jurisdiction. Your mileage may vary. But I think the principle of this Missouri case is pretty straightforward. Uh, sometimes, in order to serve your client well, to litigate and investigate a case properly, you will have to go on and use social media, uh, whether or not you are a technophobe, uh, whether you're a technophobe or not. Uh, we've all, of course, heard of cases where some personal injury plaintiff who claims some uh, terrible life-altering injury is then busted on Facebook because they're water skiing. Uh, there are certainly cases like that. Uh, use of social media is very widespread in the family law context where uh, Facebook and other platforms are used to uh, establish relationships, solicit or illicit. Um, and of course, uh, social media is also very relevant in the criminal law context. Uh, there are a lot of prosecutors here, and many of you are probably using social media to uh, research your cases, and sometimes, of of course, law enforcement uh, will use social media for sting operations, so it's very relevant. And it's also relevant uh, to defense counsel, uh, which uh, it could be relevant uh, in terms of mounting a defense for your client. Uh, so for example, uh, in the case of uh, Kennedy v. Adams, a uh, Ninth Circuit case, but bear with me, uh, the uh, court held that a, uh, <laughs> a failure to investigate the social media recantation of an allegation by an alleged victim of uh, sexual abuse uh, was uh, or constituted inadequate assistance of counsel. Now, this case actually ended up uh, being the subject of some uh, on banc activity, and my former boss uh, sought to have it reheard on banc. But for a totally separate issue related to the standards for habeas review, uh, the core holding of that case, or the holding of the case related to social media uh, and the duty of lawyers to uh, use it as an investigative tool really is not altered by the, uh, by the rest of the aspects of that case. Uh, so Judge Willett also said that I would talk briefly about the evolution of online media, which I expect we'll talk about a lot in the Q&A as well. And I guess I would just have three quick observations on that. Uh, one, as we all know, uh, and as uh, Judge Willett demonstrated by mentioning some statistics, uh, the world of online media has just grown so rapidly in uh, the past decade or so. Certainly it has exploded since the time that I first started blogging back in 2004. So it's grown in terms of usage. Uh, everyone uses uh, social media practically. Uh, my mother, I will not reveal her age, she would kill me, uh, is very active on Facebook, for instance. Uh, there are just many wonderful uh, uses of social media, and it is not just lawyers, but uh, your clients, too, who are using social media. Uh, the second thing I would say is social media and online media have grown as businesses as well. Uh, Facebook, uh, Twitter are uh, multi-billion dollar companies. Facebook is one of the largest companies uh, in the world. Uh, and even small operations like Above the Law are uh, now, of course, uh, gaining economic traction. Uh, Above the Law, I should mention, is owned by a company called Breaking Media. Uh, Breaking Media publishes about a half dozen different websites uh, focused on uh, different industries. Uh, in terms of Above the Law, we have seven-figure revenues. We have about a dozen people who work full-time on it, uh, health insurance, everything. Uh, so online 
online media, whether you're Facebook or whether you're uh, us, is now a viable way of making a living. Uh, back when I uh, first entered this business, you could probably number in the dozens the number of people in the country who were actually making a living as bloggers or as uh, social media folks. And now, of course, even law firms will hire people uh, who handle uh, their social media, essentially. It is uh, something that is uh, quite imperative for both lawyers and law firms. And the third and final point I would mention, which Judge Willett alluded to at the start, and this is perhaps a more depressing aspect of it. So I've talked about how social media has grown in size and it's grown as a business. I would say also it has grown in vitriol. I think uh, the polarization that we've seen on social media, I've noticed it just as an active user of Facebook, Twitter, uh, the types of confrontations and arguments, uh, name calling that you'll see, uh, they're all very unfortunate. And I think for those of us who've been using social media with great enthusiasm and joy for many years, uh, recent developments have, uh, have tainted that a little bit. And, uh, you know, you can locate blame for this uh, on a lot of fronts and uh, on both sides, certainly, but uh, I think it is uh, an unfortunate development that we do have to grapple with. So the final piece of advice I would offer is just uh, social media is a wonderful thing, but it is also possible to have too much of a good thing. And uh, don't be afraid to occasionally log off. Uh, I just returned to Twitter after a multi-week hiatus. And I think sometimes uh, stepping away from the computer and uh, stepping away from social media can actually be very salutary for your mental health. Uh, so with that, uh, I thank you for your attention and I look forward to interacting with you uh, online and off. David, thank you so much. Chief Judge Dillard. All right. All right. Well, it's, it's appropriate that I'm here with David. We go way back. And uh, like David, this is a bucket list item for me to be speaking at a federal society, on a federal society panel. Um, you know, I like to tell people, I like to brag, I've been involved with the Federal Society since 1993. Um, that doesn't make me one of the original gangsters, but it certainly means I like to say that I'm like after the apostles, you know, I'm like that first generation <laughs> after uh, the, the apostles in terms of FedSoc uh, lineage. So um, I'll also say something funny. Uh, somebody came up to me and said, you know, we, gosh, the one thing people like to tell me, and I don't want to take it as an insult, they're like, gosh, we really miss Judge Willett on Twitter, you know, man, he was, and he is, he was an amazing presence. And they said, but you're doing a nice job of filling his shoe. <laughs> and I said, well, maybe one shoe, um, but not both. I mean, I don't think we can ever replace Judge Willett. He, he will always, to me, be the uh, judicial Twitter king. So we, we hope to have you back soon. Um, all of that said, so what I want to talk about today um, is social media as a, a means of, of how we communicate as a society and whether or not judges ought to be involved in that. Now, judges, ostensibly at least, are supposed to be experts in language and in communication. Um, yet, when we look at state bars and their reactions to social media and some, some of the judges that I've talked to at these seminars when I've spoken throughout the country, um, there's a lot of, and I think David pointed this out, there's a lot of resistance to change. There's a lot of resistance to technology. Uh, I have a, a, a former colleague of mine who, who's since retired who had a computer in his office and, and he never used it. He was a great judge, um, but you know, it, it does seem odd to me that there is this resistance by the legal profession to engage in, in modern and forms of technology and communication. And if you doubt that, um, David did a very nice job of explaining that social media platforms and technology, how, and I'm 40, I just turned 49, in my lifetime, how we communicate with one another has dramatically changed. And if you are not on a social, if you don't understand as a judge social media or how it works or how any aspect of it, I'm not sure how you do your job effectively. David, once again, did a nice job of explaining many of the different ways that technology and social media come up in cases. Um, and if, if you doubt that, now I have two uh, teenage daughters. Um, my middle child, Lindley, um, has taught me a lot about how teenagers communicate. They really don't use text messaging much. much. They really don't use Facebook a whole lot. They really think Twitter is for old people as well. And um, my daughter um, uses, and her friends use Snapchat as text messaging, but they take photos, selfies, 
and put a message. And if you've never seen this happen in real time, it is remarkable how fast they're communicating and taking photos. I've never seen anything like it. They also use Instagram and have running commentaries on Instagram throughout the day. And it's like some sort of, you know, the old AOL chat rooms. I'm not real sure. But, but what, it, what it shows you is that, and it may very well be that in five years from now that Twitter is, is gone by the wayside or is not as prominent or Facebook, but they're, all, they're going to be new platforms. These things are, this, this form of digital communication is not going away. And judges, in my mind, we have to understand this in order to effectively represent um, the people. And we are public servants. I say this repeatedly. Uh, Judge Willett pointed out my article. Judges are public servants. We have to be connected to the people we serve. We have to be accessible. We have to be transparent. And so I, I think, and I think voters are increasingly expecting that the people that serve them will communicate with them in ways that they actually use, right? Gone are the days when judges, I think, could just go to the Rotary Club and give a speech. Uh, I think those things are still effective, and, and I think, uh, I can't remember who said it, but was, was it, uh, who said the iPhone to iPhone? Who, who made that remark yesterday? Yeah. Senator Lee, I Senator think. Senator Lee made that was remark, it? and he's right. You, you, nothing replaces talking to somebody in person, but, but you have to understand that a lot of people are talking iPhone to iPhone. People talk about their pocket friends, right, on their phone. And so you, you need to understand you, you, that you're not going to be effectively communicate in society if you are not involved in social media. And I think, once again, I think voters expect that. Social media platforms, especially for people, I'm going to sever off here state um, elected judges and federal judges for a moment um, in terms of kind of your ability to down ballot races social media is really one of the only ways that you're going to be able to get your message out and so I, I think it's important for people uh, and and judge Willett once again the leader in all this I think he he said it's political malpractice if you are a state elected official to not use it, and that applies to judges as well. So judges are, are public servants, and I think the time is coming when the people we serve are not going to be content with us to sit up in our ivory towers, in our robes, you know, our black, black robe philosopher. Um, you know, judges are different, but they are not special. Let me say that again. Judges are different, we're not special. Here's what I mean by that. Judges are different because we should never be politically partisan. We should not do anything where anybody that we serve, that we serve ever has a doubt about whether they're going to get a fair shake if they come before us. But just because we wear black robes doesn't mean that that gives us a free pass to remain cloistered like monks away from society. And I'm afraid, you know, when I was coming up, and I would meet a judge at, a, um, at, at a, an event, you know, spending a few minutes with them was really amazing just to be able to get that advice. And so social media has been transformative in allowing law students and citizens to have access to the people that serve them. Um, and as I repeatedly say, we can't lose sight of the fact that judges are public servants and they need to be accountable to the people. So um, I think now's the time for judges to embrace social media platforms. I think federal judges sh should as well, but state judges especially are directly accountable to the people. We have to stand for election, and so I think it's important to embrace the technology that the people that we serve, and to not only embrace it, but to understand it. Um, let me give you a couple of reasons why I decided to um, embrace uh, social media platforms as a judge. Number one, I use it to educate the public about the Court of Appeals of Georgia. Now, you can say, Steve, really, who's interested in the State Intermediate Appellate Court in, in Georgia? Well, okay. There are some nerds, though, that, uh, that they're my people, and they are interested. So I did some things. I wrote an article for Mercer Law Review, which is a more traditional means of, of communicating about the inner workings and culture of the Court of Appeals, but I repeatedly promote it on, online. Now, how many people that aren't lawyers have read it? I'm not sure, but it's out there, and that's important. Transparency doesn't mean that people will always use um, the information that you're giving them that I think for a free society it's important to be transparent. I promote the live streaming of our courts oral arguments. Um, 
Thank you. Thank you. I'm, um, he's, he watches. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I, I confess, I, and I give a lot of credit to the Supreme Court of Georgia, which was live streaming lo long before it was cool. When I came onto the court, you know, the first thing I said was, why aren't we live streaming? Um, we're in Atlanta. Georgia is a massive state. Um, there's, you know, our lawyers in Bainbridge shouldn't have to drive all the way up to Atlanta to watch oral argument. I shouldn't, as a lawyer, when I was in Macon, have to drive all the way up to Atlanta. The people of Georgia, we're statewide officials in Georgia, which means we're not in districts, we are statewide. And that means, I think, that the people of Georgia, if they want to, ought to have the right to watch our oral arguments online. So. I will tell you there was a lot of resistance by some of my older colleagues to that. It took me five years. I got on in 2010. It took me over five years, and I think it was the fall of 2016, we started live streaming and we have archives, and I commend you to our websites, gaappeals.us. I hate that domain, but that's it. Um, and so go to it, watch, watch those oral arguments, and I think that's an important uh, part of transparency. Um, there's other things that, that you can do as a judge to educate the public about what we do, and this is gonna dovetail into professionalism, um, but one of the things I use my account for is to promote professionalism in appellate practice. Um, we do, we give, I've had Q&As, we do, I give oral argument tips, uh, I retweet, um, you know, John Roberts has given out some really um, fascinating and, and interesting advice about how he's to prepare for oral arguments, we have legal writing trips. There is an entire culture on Twitter, a hashtag called Appellate Twitter. And the whole purpose of appellate Twitter is really about professionalism and networking and, and appellate lawyers getting together. And it's really remarkable to see this community develop. People, they'll go and have an argument in town and someone they've never met in real life that they met on Twitter, um, who they now respect because of their interactions, they'll get together, they'll have lunch. I've seen people ask questions and say, hey, I've never filed in this court before. How do I do this? Or what would you recommend? Um, that, that, we, we talk about the vitriol on Twitter. What we don't talk about are some of the really kind of the oasis of sanity in some aspects of Twitter where real relationships are being developed, professionalism is being promoted. I think that's, I don't think that demeans uh, my role as a judge to be, participate in that community and talk generally and advocate for professionalism in appellate practice and in general. Um, one of the most remarkable things, let me take a sip here, one of the most rewarding and remarkable things about being on Twitter that I never would have known, would have, could have expected, is that it is a vehicle that I'm able to use to mentor uh, law students and young lawyers. That has been very satisfying. People can, um, can ask me questions, ask for oral argument tips, legal writing tips, um, clerkship advice. Um, I frequently have people who will send me messages, what we call direct messages on Twitter, and they'll say, Judge Dillard, I noticed that, that you went back and clerked after five years in practice. I'm, I had somebody, this is recent, said, I'm, I'm thinking about doing that. Would you mind talking to me? Sure, gave them my cell number. I'm in my car a lot, commuting back and forth from Macon to Atlanta. And um, I do that because, you know, my view, I remember how important and meaningful it was when judges, just in those small moments at the, the Rotary Club or the bar events, would take a few minutes to talk to me and give me advice. Now I can do that in a remarkable way on a much broader scale. I can respond to someone's direct message in a few seconds and say, call this person, or look at this website, or check this out. That has been so rewarding, and as much as I love being a judge and writing opinions, I think the greatest legacy I will ever have as a judge is investing in people and mentoring. I think lawyers ought to do it, and, and public officials ought to do it, and I think Twitter is an amazing platform to be able to do that, not just to lawyers in Georgia, law students in Georgia, but people all over the United States and even abroad. I've had people that you know, are interested in coming and studying law in America and I've given them, I, I point them in the right direction. I have no idea how to do all of that, but I try to point those folks. Um, I, I, both David and, and Don pointed this out. Um, 
we live in a very divi- in, in divided times. Um, there's a lot of uh, vitriol. And I, for those of you who follow me on Twitter, um, I try to promote civility. I try to promote, um, uh, I think it's important to promote that and civics. Those to me are kind of first principles of American life. I don't think that should be something that's, that's controversial. I think having the position I have gives me a platform uh, being nonpartisan and embracing being nonpartisan to be able to say to those who follow me, uh, as I like to say every Friday on my sign off of the week, be good to each other. Um, that, that may sound trite, but it's not. We need to be good to each other. We need to learn to, to be able to discuss important issues in a way that is civil and to have meaningful dialogue and to not get um, and you know, separate from each other into these echo chambers. So I try to do what I can to do that. Um, and I'll, I'm, I'm about to wrap up here, but I'll just say this. It's also good politics, right? And most in life, um, doing, as my mama used to say, doing the right thing is good politics. And um, I think being on there and having people who follow me, from, especially from the state of Georgia, um, and, and who get a better sense of who I am. I mean, for better or for worse, you know some things about me if you follow me on Twitter. Um, you know I love the Sanford Bulldogs, my alma mater. Um, you know I love Radiohead and alternative music. Um, you know I love my church, and I'm, I'm dedicated. You know I love my family. Um, and you know that I love my job. And, you know, if, if somebody were to describe me um, in terms of my professional capacity at the end of my career, I hope they would say Judge Dillard was a joyful public servant. And that's what I hope comes across on my Twitter feed. And I think that is um, something that's important for the public to see, judges that love their job, that are committed to the rule of law, and are committed to serving others. So I think that, to, I don't think that demeans the office, and I'll, I'll leave with this. Are there pitfalls? Sure. Um, I actually don't think that's a bad thing. If there are judges that are uh, exercising poor judgment online, they are probably exercising poor judgment in real life. And the fact that it might be exposed on social media, while it may have short-term uh, damage to the profession or to the courts, long-term, uh, there have been people in Georgia that have done that and have been removed from the bench. And I think you know, uh, transparency reveals what it reveals, and uh, it, that's not necessarily a bad thing. So anyway, um, I, I think judges should be on, on Twitter, whether they're state or federal. Maybe we can get in that in the discussion, but thank you for having me here today. All right, thank you, Your Honor. Professor Blackman, you're batting cleanup. Thank you so much. So first off, we are all wearing bow ties at Jeff Willis' request. And second of all, I do not drink coffee, so there's no caffeine. <laughs> <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. I started law school in 2006. That year I attended my very first federal site convention. That was also the year Twitter was invented. Three years later, I came to this very hotel, and I was the first live tweeter for the federal site convention. Peter Redpath gave me a free ticket to the dinner if I tweeted about the convention. It wasn't even a thing yet. And now here we are about eight or nine years later, and we have this massive social media presence. It's being streamed online. Dozens of you have tweeted about this exact panel. I've been tweeting from the stage. We are in a very <laughs> different world. I want to talk about four areas today. Social media in the courts, social media in judges, social media for legal reporters, and social media in law schools. Um, I want to start with the courts, which is a very important aspect. And I have five principles that courts should consider. First, websites for courts should be accessible. They should look like they were created in the year 2018, not in 1996 on a dial-up modem. <laughs> Far too many court websites are awful. You can't navigate, they have old information, they have no photographs of the judges. Keep up with the times. Second, make opinions freely and easily available. Please clap for that. There is ongoing litigation about whether PACER, which is the federal system, can charge you a nickel a page. To, like you're going to a cop machine, five cents a page for PDF. That is, I think it's illegal. I'll put that aside. It's awful policy. So if you are in a state court, make your opinions available on a single page, download. I don't have to jump through a hoop, don't have to sign up for an account. And if you have a federal court, 
guess what? You can post opinions for free on your homepage. Some courts have noteworthy decisions. Just link to a PDF. The third principle, and Judge Dillard stole my thunder, live stream your arguments. I understand their arguments, pros and cons, but enough courts have tried this. It doesn't change the dynamics. I don't know if we'll crack the Supreme Court, but the lower courts can change your policies. And I said live stream, not record it and put the video on a month later. That doesn't count. People want to see information right away. There's so much disinformation, I'll get to reporters in a minute. There's so much disinformation that you can help fix by putting your own arguments live. True, people will tweet, they'll overreact, fine, but the upshots are far greater. Fourth, consider preparing summaries of opinions. Uh, the Ninth Circuit does this. They create basically a syllabus, like the Supreme Court, where they have a short overview of a decision. That is helpful. If there's a long, complicated decision, give us something. Give the press something to jump on quickly so they don't mischaracterize it. And last, this is primarily for judges who have their own dockets. Please make your opinions available that you can copy and paste. It's something called OCR, Optical Character Recognition. You, you know what this is, right? If you simply print your opinion out, sign it on paper and scan it, it's useless for us, right? We can't copy and paste from it, we can't do a control F or search. Make your opinions readable, that you can search them. It makes my life easier. In other words, I can't blog about your opinion if I can't do a control F and search for the word I'm looking for. So please, OCR. Okay. Next, social media and judges. Um, so I have a few basic principles, right? You can have an account like Judge Dillard, which is open to the public, but a lot of judges have private accounts. And this creates, I think, certain issues. Uh, recently, the Supreme Court of Florida, I think yesterday, the day before, said that uh, judges do not need to disclose if they're Facebook friends with perhaps a member of the jury or someone in the case. I'm not sure about that. But judges who do have social media accounts and recognize you are human beings, you have children, you have parents, you want to exchange information, be very, very careful. Do not friend on Facebook your litigants or any possible people in the jury. I think you should disclose it anyway. <coughs> Much better is make your account public. Let the people see what you're doing. Um, there was an article on BuzzFeed about a month ago. A number of federal judges, some in this building perhaps, have Facebook accounts. They have Twitter accounts and reporters find them. It's not hard, right? If you follow certain people and you like certain things, you can track it down. So my recommendation, judges should make their accounts public. Now, I would love if you do what Judge Dillard does and actually tweet in a meaningful way. Now, I'd asked Judge Willett if he would tweet from the podium today. He gave me a that's a no from Simon Cowell meme. Um, <laughs> So he said no, but I, I would hope that more judges engage in the manner that Judge uh, Diller does and Justice Willett did. It's valuable, right? If I just tweet, I'm no one, but when a judge is, wow, that's a big deal. So it's a very important aspect. Uh, I'll mention briefly, apparently now Twitter is good for federal courts, right? Courts just cite tweets as if they're any evidence. So to the extent that you have any interest in government, your tweets can and will be used against you. I think one of the more dispiriting aspects of recent confirmation processes is focusing on tweets of judges that are entirely innocuous. It's disgusting, but they will use it against you, so be very, very careful, right? Don't put something on Twitter. If you delete it, it doesn't matter. It's still there. It's preserved for eternity. The next aspect of my talk is social media and legal reporting. Um, the way reporters cover the courts has changed drastically in the past two decades or so. <laughs> it used to be that you'd have a Supreme Court decision in the morning, and the reporters would write a story for the next day daily paper. No more. They have to get stories out within minutes of the decision. They basically write their stories in advance and just plug in the holding. It's remarkable. It used to be that they could ask an expert for an opinion when the reporters came out. No, no, it's right away. So you need speed, which is why putting the opinions online in a searchable format is key. Whoever tweets about it first sets the agenda. And far too often, people tweeting are wrong, and they change the agenda, and I have to try and fix it. It's a full-time job, but I try very hard. Um, so put your opinions online quickly. Uh, if you're a court saying we're going to announce opinions at 10 o'clock on a certain day, that's very good. Let the media know. Um, but one of the consequences of the decline in legal reporting is you have fewer reporters who cover courts. Used to be you'd have a, one reporter, his full-time job was the courts. No more. So now you have the political reporter comes over and does courts every now and then, or maybe the person does a school board, does courts. They don't know nearly as much. I think that's unfortunate. And a lot of legal reporting today suffers for that exact reason, which is why tweeters, like myself, can help bridge that gap, right? Reporters call upon us, say what the hell is going on, and we can give them instant impact as long as we have the PDF of the opinion, right? I don't trust a story that doesn't have a link to an opinion. I just don't trust it because I can't verify it for myself. Uh, one other innovation, screenshots. If there's an opinion and there's a key passage, put in a screenshot right in the tweet. 
people more likely to read tweets when there's a picture in it, we like pictures, and you can jump to it right away. Uh, one last comment. Um, Judges have different policies when reporters contact chambers, right? Sometimes they say no comment, they decline to comment. Uh, I think a good general policy is don't even say anything, just ignore it. Uh, even the no comment is kind of a comment, so I would just ignore it altogether. Um, the last part of my talk is the one nearest and dearest to my heart, which is law schools. I've been teaching now for seven years. I speak at about 40 or 50 law schools a year, so I get a lot of experience. And I can't tell you how much social media has transformed that experience. It's remarkable. I'm walking up and down the halls of the Mayflower. He's like, hey, Josh, I know you're from Twitter. It's stunning. People know this. They get to know you. They think they know you. Maybe they don't. I don't know. I don't drink coffee. But they think they know you well enough. <laughs> but a couple of principles for law professors. First, live stream your lectures. Let me give you a couple reasons why. First, you benefit your students immeasurably. They can't possibly write down everything you say. They shouldn't. If my students know my lectures are online, they're not doing this thing with their typing friends. They can go back and check later. In fact, my students watch last year's lecture before class, so they know what I'm going to say. That's powerful. But this is not just for your own students. I have students around the globe who watch my lectures. Thousands of them. I don't know who they are, but they say, you know what? I, you got me through property. You got me through Connell, and I meet them on the road. It's, it's frankly stunning. So put your lectures on YouTube. Professors say, well, I may say something inappropriate. Get over it. Your kids are recording you anyway, right? If you, say something, <laughs> if you say something inappropriate, they will have a recording of it. And let me make a point that's not too subtle. You have backup of your own recording, right? They can't quote you out of context if you have your own recording. I've been protested, I've been heckled. Do I know something? I have the complete video from beginning to end. They cannot take me out of context. I've had students accuse me of saying things that I never said. I say, show me the tape and it goes away real quick. So it's for your own preservation that you're always being recorded, and I value that very highly. Also, you can use Twitter to engage students. Judge Dillard mentors them. I can just answer questions. If the student puts a question on Twitter, I'll answer it. And that's a direct communication line that may not otherwise exist, okay? Um, one other issue to think about in social media is discipline issues, right? Uh, law students often get very active, very feisty. They, they like to fight. But sometimes they do it on social media, and they actually taunt each other in class. And discussions that begin in class spill over into class Facebook pages. I tend to stay away from it, but I think at some point schools will try to discipline that and police that. I think there's some First Amendment issues at state schools and other issues that go beyond the scope, but it's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, another related issue is tenure and professors saying stupid things on Twitter, right? Is a professor's Twitter account um, part of his academic freedom, right? You've had professors make virulent comments about the right or the left on Twitter, can you discipline them for that? Does it promote the academic discourse? My uh, general sentiment is yes, it's part of the academic discourse. Uh, we use lots of different mediums to communicate. Uh, my last point to reiterate something that John mentioned, that, that Twitter's pretty awful, right? Uh, there's a lot of, and David as well, there's a lot of hatred, racism, sexism, every ism you can imagine. Um, I encourage you strongly, and I mean this sincerely, do not feel the need to reply. The most powerful thing I ever did on Twitter was saying, you know what, I don't need to reply to this person. And that's the most effective response ever. I've had people message me saying, why don't you reply to me? I'm like, I don't want to. And it kills them. So if people stop <laughs> replying, or instead of replying, send them an email, right? I've had professors say awful things to me on Twitter. I send them an email, we diffuse it in three seconds. You're not gonna diffuse an argument on Twitter. Disengage, right? Use it to push information, but don't get into fights that you are not going to win. Thank you all so much. Um, big thanks to our panels. That was a high-octane presentation from everybody. High-octane and, and well-dressed. Um, <laughs> we have a hard stop because we've got the debate at 12.30, so we're going to stop about 12.25. So we got about, there's some early birds going to get a table. Uh, we got about 16 <laughs> minutes uh, for, unless y'all want to do some cross-panel discussion, we can just turn it over to the crowd, but as people are coming to the microphone, I want to give a hearty, passionate, spirited amen to cameras. And my, my former court, the Texas Supreme Court, has been webcasting live for about a decade. Zero problems. Overwhelmingly positive response. Um, if you're lying awake at night, 
insomnia creeps in, <laughs> just log on and pick a case, any case. They're all archived there for posterity. And um, people talk about the fear of grandstanding or peacocking or showboating. There's no showboating in Texas. I mean, <laughs> people say they notice a certain swagger, but in Texas, we just call that walking. So, okay, you're first. Go right ahead. <laughs> uh, so, I'll just ask loudly, uh, both to uh, Judge Dillard and Willett, um, I've been, a conundrum for me lately is how uh, can citizens vote for state court judges if the judiciary is a black box? We don't know these people, we don't know what they do, and unless you live at the courthouse, you will not know what they do and how to vote. Uh, but you're giving me some hope that there may be ways for judges to make themselves more visible to the electorate. I'm wondering if, uh, you know, what your thoughts are on there is what is it allowable so that we don't have to be monks? I mean, I'm not a judge, but I've been asked to be a judge and I've turned it down because I'm much too vocal. Uh, so if there's a way to channel that, then maybe I'll reconsider. Thank you. Uh, well, I'll try to answer that. I mean, you, you bring up a great point. Uh, on the one hand, what do we hear every election cycle? We don't know enough about the down ballot races. We don't know enough about the judges. Who are these judges? And yet these same media types and reporters that say that then are like, judges on social media? What's that about? Um, so, you know, I, I think the answer to it is, is that Exactly what I said is that you use social media platforms to engage the people you serve and you can do that in a way that's meaningful and that doesn't violate the canons uh, simply by being out there. Look, at the end of the day, or is the average citizen going to know about my parental rights jurisprudence? Probably not. Um, but what they can get a sense of um, uh, from my Twitter feed without me getting into specific cases is I hope, at least, that this is, this is a judge who is, is fair, this is a judge who's impartial, this is a judge who cares about his job, who is professional, and who loves doing what he does for the state of Georgia. And I think that is a more than sufficient basis for somebody who is not trained in law to cast a vote. Um, it seems to me that uh, the federal judicial branches uh, are uh, sort of lagging behind uh, the trend of state social media judges on on, uh, on social media. Uh, Judge Willett has uh, obviously gone radio silent, and probably there's uh, people from the administrative office were were, uh, were gave him gave him the training. Um, there was also a, a somewhat famous blog by uh, Judge Richard Kopp of the District of Nebraska. He had a blog called Hercules and the Empire. Mm -hmm. uh, he just stopped doing that, and for reasons that are not entirely clear, so um, could, can anyone speak specifically? They're pretty clear. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We, we, we know why stop. Um, let me just, I, I don't want to jump in again, but let me just say this, that his blog was a good example of yeah. the right way to use it and the wrong way. The right way that he used it was some of the kind of reflective commentary <coughs> regarding Sean Hopwood and his sentencing. I thought that was amazing to have a sitting federal judge um, reflect and say, you know, maybe I didn't use the best judgment in sentencing not only this young man but other people. I thought that was remarkable. His other comments, um, which I'm not going to get into the specifics, if you want to um, know those, you can Google them, I think are an example of maybe the admonition from David. Maybe sometimes it's, it's good to step away um, if, if you're getting too... Um, caught up in things. I mean, you, once again, whether you're a federal or state judge, whether you're elected or appointed, you still have to follow the canons and you still have to act responsibly, whether, it's on, whether you're online or in person. I uh, would add, uh, in terms of what Judge Kopf has done well, please check out his review of my book, Supreme Ambitions. <laughs> but uh, I would add, uh, to just echo what Ch uh, Chief Judge Dillard said, it's absolutely true. The rules that apply to judges ethically are the same regardless of the medium. So for example, you're not supposed to comment on a pending case. Uh, there was an interesting case out of the Ninth Circuit called Sierra Pacific where there was a trial judge uh, who had a Twitter account and he followed the U.S. attorney but he didn't follow the other party 
and he retweeted a news article about a case that was pending before him, and you might think, oh, isn't that innocuous? He's just retweeting a news article. But it turned out that the article was erroneous. The headline was erroneous. The headline said the defendant admitted liability when the actual settlement resolving the litigation provided for no admission of liability. So uh, this was actually used as a grounds for appeal before the Ninth Circuit, saying that the judge actually exhibited some bias by following one party but not the other, and by retweeting this headline that was a uh, more favorable to the position of the U.S. attorney rather than the defendant. So I think that it is wonderful for judges to be on social media, and I think it's a great engine for civic education, but the same rules apply, and there are interesting case studies of how judges can make mistakes. And I can, I can add that as a faculty member of the Federal Judicial Center, I teach federal judges. They're very interested in doing things the right way when it comes to social media. There's already been at least one uh, advisory uh, opinion uh, uh, by the commission that oversees uh, fe the federal judiciary. Um, you know, there may very well be some more guidance, but I can tell you it's an issue that's very much on their radar. And, you know, as, uh, you know, both Judge Dillard and, and David explained about examples like uh, Judge Koff, you know, I've, I've written and blogged and maybe even posted on Facebook about Judge Koff. And yes, there's, uh, there's some wonderful things about his previous blogging, about insights into judicial decision making. And then there are some things that are just, uh, you know, I'd put them under the category as, as he described it, dirty old man. Um, but that's, um, you know, there are some do's and don'ts inherent in both of those. If you're interested in learning more, you can check out my law review article, The Judge as Digital Citizen. Uh, in the Faulkner Law Review, uh, Judge Bill Pryor and I served on a panel about uh, the role of the judge in the 21st century. I just want to free the, free the Tweeter Laureate. <laughs> <laughs> Go right ahead. Hi, uh, Dan McLaughlin uh, at Baseball Crank. Um, oh, um, I follow you. Great Twitter account. <laughs> oh, you don't Twitter. follow me, though. <laughs> <laughs> I don't take it personally. <laughs> <laughs> but you remembered it. <laughs> um, everyone has their own opinions about the president's uh, tweeting, and, and, and obviously that's a broad subject, but just to stick to a very narrow question, has the mere fact of having a president of the United States who tweets in what is very identifiably his own voice um, changed the public expectation surrounding even judges and, and other public servants to be more accessible and more out there on Twitter? I, I, let, let me start out with this. I think the answer is yes, uh, and we're seeing that more and more, but it's also leading to some other legal questions that we haven't had to confront before, such as uh, with respect to a government official or entity blocking an individual from following them on Twitter. Is that a limited public forum? Um, you know, there are courts around the country that have confronted this. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, the president has been uh, on the receiving end of, of some legal action as well, but there have been other governmental officials around the country, and the decisions uh, right now are, are a hodgepodge. So I don't think we have any clear guidance as of yet. I think it helps. Uh, some legal scholars may disagree. I know uh, I've got some uh, support in thinking that uh, the president's Twitter account that uh, was his personal account that predated um, his uh, taking office uh, could very well be considered, you know, his personal account, not a, a official forum uh, or, or media outlet. But, you know, there are some legal scholars who disagree. I think we're still waiting for that issue to, you know, resolve itself. But it is very much, it's raising issues like that. Uh, it's leading to a lot of discourse, and we'll see what happens. If I could kind of have a mashup of John's comment about this limited public forum issue, which is quite interesting, and Josh's comment about not responding to trolls, my favorite feature on Twitter is actually the mute button because you will no longer see the tweets of people you mute, people that are abusive, people that are uncivil, but if you block them, then they know they got to you. They get notified that you block them. If you mute them, they have no idea. They could be tweeting up a nasty storm at you and you are oblivious, and for me, actually, I'm actually fine with that. So check out the mute function if you're on Twitter. And one better, there's mute thread. Where, where last night I tweeted this, uh, at the dinner, uh, the standing ovation we gave for Judge Kavanaugh, Maggie Haberman at the New York Times retweeted me, I got 50,000 angry messages after that. I went, Howard Dean tweeted me. I think he was so even around. <laughs> Howard Dean retweeted me. 
God help me. So I said, mute thread, poof, gone. My timeline cleans up immediately. You can't mute 50,000 people, you can mute the thread. Yes, sir. I feel like I should be taller. Uh, John Farrey from Boston. I use LinkedIn a lot, and I use, and I, if you don't know it, I can't explain it, if, the, if this, then that, to increase the number of postings where automatically it'll go in, find business postings or articles I want to repost, uh, some from reputable sources like the journal, some from non-reputable like the New York Times. Um, what, from a, lot, from a risk point of view, pulling from, from sources like that, do I have a risk situation where it may pull an article that may follow up and cause me problems later on? And I'm posting probably 12 to 20 of these a day. You're not offering, are you adding commentary? No. We, okay. No. I do separately on certain ones, but a lot of them are just a reposting automatically, seeing an article that I, that I have pre-programmed in might be of interest, and then reposting that. Are you, hey, let me ask, are you a judge or a lawyer? I'm a lawyer. Okay, all right, well, that, I'd have a different response if you were a judge. Yeah, I mean, ju judges uh, can get into ethical uh, hot water for liking uh, something and for retweeting or posting something even without any kind of commentary, you know, it, it's happened. But as a lawyer in private practice, if you're just posting something and not adding commentary of your own, uh, I, I don't think there's a, as high a risk factor. Now, uh, I would add that you probably, and you're probably just organically aware of this, there are issues of essentially not a true conflict with your client's interest, but a sort of positional risk. If you tend to be a lawyer who represents a lot of plaintiffs and you are retweeting some articles that are very pro-defendant, maybe there might be some issue there, but I, I do generally subscribe to the whole thing that people used to have as a standard disclaimer, but I think it's just now so standard and accepted that nobody really needs to add it. You know, RTs are not endorsements. People retweet things all the time. If I retweet something, it does not mean that I agree with every word in that, and that isn't, that can't even be the case because I'm often retweet, because I have, I, my Twitter feed is actually fairly sort of middle of the road. I will retweet opposing viewpoints just because I think they're interesting, and obviously I can't agree with both of them because they disagree with each other. So I think as a lawyer, it's less risky. If you're a judge, then you have a sort of tricky issue like what I mentioned about that Sierra Pacific case where even a retweet uh, of an article, if it's erroneous or if it favors one party or the, or the other, could be cited by a party as, as a basis for recusal. And, and just very quickly, for those of you in the audience who are members of the DC Bar, you may want to uh, check out a November 2016 uh, DC Legal Ethics Committee opinion on how social media uh, conduct can create what are called positional conflicts. Uh, where you're advocating a position and you're acting contrary to something that's a, a position of the client or the firm. We got two minutes, two more questions. I may regret this. I'm going to go to Ilya in the back and then back to the front mic for the, for the final question. Ilya, don't make me. <laughs> Uh, I don't I actually don't have a social media question. I have a fashion question. I'm as a sometimes but not always bow tie. I see Ilya's time has expired. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead, go ahead. Uh, actually, uh, this uh, is Ilya's tie that I'm wearing today. I had well, a gold version. It has the Constitution on it. We made a Pareto Optimal Exchange yesterday. We preferred the other's coloring of the Constitution bow tie, but that relates to my question. Uh, what is the provenance of your current bow tie? And as a sometimes but not always bow tie wearer, what are uh, your, your advice on when to wear a, a bow tie and when to go standard? Mute. <laughs> You're going to mute the question. I, 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 I'm going to say, as a novice bow tie wearer, uh, choosing to accessorize these Star Wars cufflinks with the <laughs> Star Wars tie, or the other way around, I'm, I'm liking this. I'm thinking this may be a good look. I'm, you know. Uh, I, 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 resp I respectfully dissent. I think you have to, my problem is, I noticed this in the mirror today. I am a short person. I have a round face. This bow tie is not good. I need something that accentuates my length. So I'm going back to the regular ties after this. <laughs> all right, that's all Bow ties are cool. Bow ties are cool. <laughs> It'll delete your account. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my question is for uh, Professor Blackman. 
Uh, you mentioned that you promote the use of recordings not only as a pedagogical tool, but also as a shield against uh, yeah. false or baseless accusations or misrepresentations, as well as for other uses potentially. Uh, however, many students, uh, faculty members and administrators are students or members of a university in a jurisdiction where one party consent is not the law or where the university has a policy explicitly forbidding the use of recordings in the classroom or elsewhere. What advice would you give to students, faculty, members, and administrators in such jurisdictions or universities? Yeah, you have to follow wiretap laws. Um, you can get <laughs> consent from your students. One way I kind of work around it is I have a lapel mic, and you really can't even hear the students at all, so it's just my voice, so it troubles me less. Uh, but university policy should consider otherwise. I consider information free and open. The world should have access to it. Every time I give a lecture, someone else can benefit from it. So I think there are lots of things to gain. There's a slight risk of chilling speech, which I'm not ignorant of. Students may not want to speak up, comes up with their confirmation hearing in 20 years. Like when I go to Harvard, they've never let me record anything. It's not, it's not allowed because they don't want to be Supreme Court justices. But I think there are a lot of benefits and schools should maybe reconsider those policies. Thank you, sir. Thank you. All right. Let's go eat. Everybody thank our wonderful panel.